Report from Santa Fe is made possible in part by grants from the members of the National Education Association of New Mexico, an organization of professionals who believe that investing in public education is an investment in our state's economic future. And by a grant from the Healy Foundation, Taos, New Mexico. Hello, I'm Lorraine Mills, and today we're doing a very special show about behavioral health. I want you to know that we have invited a very knowledgeable Republican lawmaker who, due to medical issues, could not be here. But I'm honored to say we've got two of the lawmakers who have followed this issue from the beginning. And I'm proud to introduce Senator Gerald Ortiz Pino, Democrat from Albuquerque. You've been up here since 2004. That's right. This is my 11th year. Ah, and you're the chair of the Public Affairs Committee in the Senate and on rules also, right? That's right. I serve on rules. Yeah. Our other senator is Senator Bill O'Neill, Democrat from Albuquerque. You were four years in the House, mm -hmm. and now this is your third year right. in the Senate. You're moving up. Lucky seven. Yes. You are also, both of you, by the way, have been on the Interim Behavioral Health Subcommittee, which is why I've asked you for your expertise. You're also on Public Affairs and, you're Vice Chair of Public Affairs and on Education, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, um, thank you for joining us. Glad to. Glad to. What is behavioral health and what did it used to be called? This is a sure. term that puts people off a little bit. It, it does. I mean, for many years we used to talk about mental health and addiction and alcoholism, and they were kept somehow discreet. Now we just use the umbrella term, behavioral health, to refer to all three of those conditions. So people who have mental illness, people who have alcohol uh, problems, and people who have drug addictions are all served by programs that come under the the umbrella, the canopy of behavioral health services. Before we get into what's happening now with this crisis in behavioral health, can you each tell me a little about your background? Because um, you bring some of your own experience into sure. this issue. Well, first of all, I'm a liberal arts casualty uh, history major from Cornell University, but I basically found my adult life out here in New Mexico, and I'm so blessed. I grew up in Ohio. But I've been able to make service my vocation in New Mexico. So for years I worked with a program called Dismas House New Mexico, which worked, which um, dealt with men and women coming out of prison, parolees, reintegrating back into the community. But where my real experience with the behavioral health issue has been recently is I was the executive director of the State Juvenile Parole Board for three years, and it was a real eye-opener. And we really relied on a lot of these programs that were sadly shut down by this hostile takeover by Arizona companies, such as Hogadas, for example, which is in the middle of my district, right on Griegos, in between 12th and Rio Grande. And 40 years that that program did stellar work with troubled, troubled kids that I you know, came to know personally. And the notion that, that Hogaris is no longer, um, the facility is shuttered, there's this vague Arizona company called Open Skies that took over, and I have, it's really, really distressing to me, and it's been a real, uh, it's been personal for me, and it's a big part of, of um, my district in the sense that my constituents are just really, really upset about what happened to a great program. Well... Jerry, tell us a little about your background, and then would you give us a history about this hostile takeover oh, sure. to which Bill referred? Um, well, I, I'm a social worker by training, and I spent 40-plus uh, years working in the field of social work in New Mexico, a lot of it with kids, a lot of it in, in, in connection with uh, programs such as the ones that just got shut down. Uh, for a while, I worked in Taos, I worked in Las Vegas, I worked in Santa Fe. But for the last 30 years, I've been in Albuquerque, where I, where I watched Ogadis develop into a, a wonderful program. I watched YDI develop into a strong, active program with, with a real skill at reaching troubled kids. Uh, all of these programs that were shut down last year, or now it's a, almost two years ago, uh, had long histories in New Mexico. These were not Johnny-come-lately programs. They, they had been here for decades, doing good work, under all sorts of adverse conditions. I mean, that's one of the things I really would like to come back to. That is, in those days, you could not make any money doing behavioral health work. 
because those contracts, Title 20 contracts, then later some Medicaid contracts, they were all tightly constrained. There were, there were limited ability of the programs to even survive financially. Many of them provided services at no expense to the state at all, just to keep the service network going. And for those programs to be accused of fraud two years ago was a shock, I think. We, we all basically were just astounded that the 15 largest behavioral health service programs in the state, all of whom were grassroots based, the vast majority of which were nonprofits, were accused of Medicaid fraud and were immediately suspended from the program. And it just did not seem fair. It seemed not seem American that they wouldn't even be told what they were accused of and had no opportunity to respond. They just were told, turn your buildings, your computers, your staff, and your clients over to these Arizona companies and get out of the way as fast as you can. I remember, Lorraine, if I can interject. Yes, please. My chairman here saying in committee when we heard this, this is an execution of the behavioral health providers of the state. And I know that in July of 2013, our governor looked in the cameras and said there will be no cessation of services, no suspension of services. This will be a seamless transition. Mm -hmm. And you fast forward to where we are right now. We have my former Republican colleague from the House, the mayor of Roswell, saying clearly in, in the media that there is a crisis in Chavez County. These providers are leaving. Well, we can get to that. But, you yeah. know, as to the promised smooth sailing new way and no due process that's the bottom line these folks yeah. had no they couldn't face their accuser no. they couldn't rectify errors because now that the audits have been released there were simple errors like someone might have forgotten to sign a form or somebody thought some uh, an employee didn't have the proper credentials it that's turned right. out they did yeah. there were arithmetic errors there that's were things right. like that that's but right. how wrong code used in billing i mean stuff that should have been Fixable. Changed, fixed and changed and moved on. Mm -hmm. Instead, they're accused of fraud. Where did this come from? How did this happen? Well, I mean, I, you know, for years we've been very critical of the, of the way that the department was overseeing the program. The company that they had selected, the department in this case is the Human Services mm -hmm. Department, the Medicaid agency. The, the company they selected to run the program was... First it was value options, and they switched the contract about five years ago to Optum Health. And from day one, Optum was worse than value options had ever been. I think I don't think anybody would argue with my saying that. They were late on payments. They made missed payments. They tried to recoup money from agencies that they had already paid for services. It was a chaotic transition from value options to Optum. And we were constantly getting complaints from providers about their inability to find out why certain bills hadn't been paid, why certain clients were turned down for services that were badly needed. It was a, it was a very poorly, we thought, administered program. In fact, at one time, the state suspended uh, Optum and fined them a million dollars. I shouldn't say suspended, but they disciplined them and fined them a million dollars for the mistakes they had been making in the program. Well, all of these 15 providers were reviewed annually. There were annual audits performed by Optum. They all passed all of those audits. There was never a finding that we suspect fraud, they mm -hmm. should be examined, we need to send in a special audit. Nothing like that ever came up in the four years, first four years that Optum ran the program. In the fifth year, all of a sudden Optum complained to human services that they thought even after they had just given clean audits to these companies, they thought there was some concern over fraud. And so the state brought in, well, let's give the sequence right. As soon as they made that complaint, the state went to Arizona and found seven companies, five companies in Arizona, that they said, if we suspend the New Mexico providers of behavioral health, can you come in and take over and keep things going? And the Arizona company said yes. Then the state ordered an audit. $3 million audit. They spent $3 million on an audit. No bid. A yeah. no bid audit that um, found, we don't know what the audit found. I mean, it's just been released by the Attorney General, but you know, there was no evidence of fraud in the audit, but that audit was used as the basis for suspending the payments. 
So you have, you know, a terribly, uh, it's a kangaroo court. That's the only way to, to, mm -hmm. to describe it. You have the same person who declared them to be committing fraud, suspending it, and then saying, I'm sorry, you cannot appeal this. We're turning it all over to the attorney general for prosecution. And in, a, in, a, in one fell swoop, the entire behavioral health, not the entire, 85 percent of the behavioral health system in this state was wiped off the map. Well, the, the most tragic thing to me is that the behavioral health mm -hmm. clients or patients are the most vulnerable. Mm -hmm. They are already struggling. Mm -hmm. You might get a young teenage schizophrenic who finally has a therapist that they like. That's or you right. might have somebody who depends on meds. I understood that some of these Arizona companies came in and they didn't have pharmacy licenses. So they couldn't prescribe patients who depend on meds to be stable. That's right. You, you want to talk about the $27 million that was paid them to come? Oh, oh that, it's just, it's <laughs> such a bad thing. I personally, to follow up on what you just yeah. said, when, when I'm, I'm hearing the, the governor say that in July of 2013, no problem, there won't, this is a piece of cake, we got it. I'm thinking, first of all, this one, with all due respect, knows nothing about therapy, no, no, knows nothing about how tenuous it is to get a traumatized 17-year-old uh, juvenile who's in the system trying to make sense of her life dealing with family wounds they finally like you said you you finally have a therapeutic relationship developed bingo they're gone I mean the whole agency gone is gone we're talking in large programmatic you know ways here but in a real personal level in the best case scenario we spend we're 50th in the nation in what we spend on behavioral health I mean in the in the best status quo kind of context, we, you know, it's been it's hard. Mm -hmm. And then you throw this wrench in where, and if you do a quick little survey of, of the Arizona companies that took over, how many are left? Four. I Same mean, ones on I the mean, way out the door. I mean, there's there. It's not working. We have a crisis in Chavez County. Agave is is are they still here? I mean, you just I, here, we hear a lot they're anecdotally. They're about Turquoise, one of the companies named Turquoise, has already left the state. They said. We simply can't make any money doing this. <laughs> and so they left. Well, my gosh, if the New Mexico companies had ever tried to say that, they would have been held to their contracts, forced to, you know, to right. restructure themselves, trim their costs, do something, but they wouldn't have been allowed to just go back home, take up their, their uh, profits and, and go home. But that's exactly what one has already done. And, and a couple of others, apparently, the rumor is a couple of others are considering the same thing. Rumblings. We yeah. hear a lot yeah. of rumblings. So it's not just the impact on the individual patients and the, and the world of hurt there, but the communities are suffering. The mayor of Roswell, yeah. uh, Kintai, has been really you know, going around trying to say, we will have nothing left. We had under uh, Southwest Con counseling we had they had 2500 patients mm -hmm. when turquoise came in it was reduced to 1100 that's a lot of people not getting services and now there's less and there's nobody in place mm -hmm. there'll be nobody there's a very good judge james hudson who's working on a committee they're really trying to to and they have some possibilities but this is a whole community left bereft for mm -hmm. their most vulnerable patients also we're losing social workers we're losing mental health professionals i mean it's it's just uh I just know some personally that have left the state or changed professions. It's not, it's, this is really, a, this is a, something that plays out on a lot of levels. And it's just a... Um, now, at the same time that that's going on, we have budgeted and are spending more money on behavioral health than we ever have before. And providing care for less people. That's exactly right. We're spending more and getting less out the end because we're spending it on managed care behavioral health. Well, what that means, all, that's a fancy name for just meaning that we're paying four managed care companies, the same ones that have the regular primary care contracts with Medicaid, to be responsible for behavioral health besides that. And so we're giving them extra money every month for anybody enrolled in their program. Here's a little extra to cover their behavioral health needs. Whether or not there's any services provided mm. is is beside the point. They're getting that money every month. We will spend every dime of that $590 million by the end of the fiscal year. We probably won't get $590 million worth of services out of it. We won't know how many actual services we've gotten out of it for a year or two because that's when those managed care companies will have to provide data that we can analyze and see what's happened. So you've got this incredible situation in which 
the services are provided at the community level by fewer and fewer people. They're just, the system has been destroyed. The money coming into the system is greater and greater. And it's going somewhere, but it's not reaching the public. Well, we're speaking today with <laughs> two of well, very well respected and knowledgeable lawmakers, Senator Bill O'Neill and Senator Jerry Ortiz Pino. Um, we took a little uh, talk about why, when it happened, what happened. We haven't done really why it happened, and the famous question of all murder mysteries, qui bono, who benefited <laughs> from this? Because it wasn't the patients and it mm. wasn't the communities. Who it's benefited? Certainly not the, right? It's certainly not New Mexico. I, mm -hmm. It's a, a big... One thing we haven't remember. mentioned is that we spent $27 million bringing those Arizona companies in, and that was not Medicaid matched money. That was all state money given to them to help entice them to come into New Mexico. And some of those bills were really Outreaches. offensive. Outreaches. The time an executive spent in the airport waiting for his yeah. flight at $300 an hour, something That's like that. Right. I mean, yeah. that is not helping the little kid down the street. Not at all. And, and that was money we just flushed away. That, that's gone, and, and we'll never get that money back. But the, but the system has to be restored. Now, who benefited? I, I've got theories. People will talk about the political angle, the campaign donation angle. To me, the only thing that makes sense to be, t to be this destructive of a pre-existing system is that somebody in a position of influence, either the secretary of the Human Services Department, the head of the Medicaid program, or the governor decided that our current behavioral health system is so bad that we've got to start over again with the new one. And we're told that by the companies that were in the process of negotiating for these new centennial care contracts. So those are the big four companies that have the multi-million the billion dollars, I mean, let's keep this in perspective. I said $590 million to spend on behavioral health. That's a fraction of the total Medicaid contract, which yeah. now is, I think it's, it's four and a half billion dollars we're spending on Medicaid this current year. In the, in in the current state. year, $4.5 billion. The whole state budget is 6.2. Uh, but this, of course, has a huge influx or infusion of federal dollars. Mm -hmm. So uh, state dollars, it's not, you know, it's, it's still a lot. It's a billion dollars, but that's matched with federal money, and so you get, you know, the total package is huge. That's a lot of money to be dealing with. I think that, I think the managed care companies let it be known that if they were going to be expected to provide behavioral health, they didn't want to do it through that existing system. Mm -hmm. They wanted that off the, off the table, clear them out of the way, and start over again afresh. Well, you can't do that with people's lives. And so yeah. they brought in the Arizona companies, and now the Arizona companies have found out they were just used, they were in the middle, they were being manipulated. They're bailing, and now the HMOs are going to have to reconstruct the system from the ground up. And they don't have to pay the consequences. This is the difference between primary care managed care and behavioral health managed care, and it's an important point. In primary care, if you don't... You, you're given money to keep people healthy. You don't keep them healthy. You're going to pay money when they go to the hospital. Or we're going to pay money when they're sh shot by police and yeah. where they're, mm -hmm. when they shoot, when there's a, you know, a school right. shooting, things like that. We pay in terrible, tragic ways. That's right. But in behavioral health, if, they get, if, if, if you're paid to keep them well behaviorally and you don't, you don't have to pay the consequences out of your budget. It's the police... Mm -hmm. The jails, mm -hmm. the homeless shelters, and the prisons that will pay the cost of that, not mm -hmm. your budget. And again, you know, the, the theme for me, the thing that I, I still, I just have a real hard time with this, is the lack of due process. I mean, it, it's just you don't put people out of business and, and based on audit findings that they don't even know what they, they haven't, they still don't know what, well, and now finally we, we get some transparency there, but it's, they're gone. They're gone. And you know? they'll never get their reputation And can you back? spell the word lawsuit? Excuse me? Yeah, I mean, for sure. several of these entities, well-respected entities, um, mm -hmm. I think somebody was really asleep at the switch up, upstairs. I mean, just, I, I, I still don't understand that, this complete 
um, disregard yeah. and, of, and, and of let's, due process. And let's talk the politics of it. I mean, the, the, the harsh fact is that this should have been a campaign issue in the last election. Yes. It wasn't. It never got mentioned by either side because the Democratic candidate was the attorney general who accepted those allegations and who fell into the whole failure to provide due process pattern. Mm -hmm. So there was nobody to say, wait a second, the voters should at least hear both sides of this and decide who's... They were both aligned on stamping out Medicaid fraud no matter how phony the charges. Now, the, the news of the week is that Hector Balderas, the new attorney general, released the audits. They're somewhat redacted, but you can still, and I've been reading and reading and reading at them. What I understand is it's not really an audit. They took sampling and they, they extrapolated mm -hmm. what might be, and it's just not there. Sure. And also fraud, um, there's intent involved in fraud. You, exactly. you mean to cheat somebody. You mean to take something. And it doesn't look like there's a lot of intention here. Now, last session and this session, last session you had a lot of bills. Now I think Mary Kay Papin has. Yes. has and there's one to insist that they have due process. There's one to uh, define what is Medicaid fraud. Yeah. So let's look at what is being done to fix all this and i think you have a list of some of the things that your committee in the interim the behavioral health subcommittee has come up with some solutions so we don't have much time left sure. let's let's look Run at the fix how movement. can we fix right. this well the 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 committee took a look at it over the summer the behavioral health services um, subcommittee of the health and human services committee and and keep in mind that senator mary Kay papen is probably the leading proponent of improving our behavioral health system in the Senate, in the legislature. She's a strong advocate. She wanted to go the route of the assisted outpatient treatment bill. And so what we came up with were a whole series of, 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 of pieces of legislation that would expand the money the state is spending to make the assisted outpatient treatment bill work. If you say you, you can take somebody into court and force them to get treatment, you better have some treatment available. All of these bills are outside of the Medicaid program because we thought it made no sense to put more money, good money after bad, into that system that's not producing services where they're needed. Mm -hmm. So we, we came up with the, uh, the package of uh, half a dozen bills that expand services outside of Medicaid. They put money into, for example, school-based health centers. And they would be use the money it has to be all state money at this juncture because it's not matched with Medicaid. But they're putting money into hiring workers in school-based health centers who can provide the counseling to the kids. Money put into primary care clinics around the state. Mm -hmm. We have a network of primary care clinics. They will all be able, if this bill passes, to hire more behavioral health service workers. And you have a bill about a behavioral health warm line, not a hot line. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a, it was one that came from UNM, a suggestion that maybe one of the things that was needed to make the system work better would be a place, a single number that anybody in the state could call, and they would be given information about what in their community was available, and they would keep it up to date. The, 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 they thought yeah. they had the resources to keep it up to date. And we're so close to the end of the show. Mm -hmm. what, are, what are the solutions that you are working toward well, on behalf of I think, New Mexicans? I think, you know, honestly, I think we have a bipartisan consensus on due process. Yeah. I mean, this isn't rocket science, okay? Like, so like if you, you, accuse, people, you should be able to face yes, your accuser. And, and I know that a lot of... Um, you should know what you're accused of. Yeah. yeah. And I, I've been on the, your show last year with Senator Beffert, Sue Wilson Beffert, and she was sensitive to to this due process issue. Others are, both publicly and privately, our, our friends on the other side. So looking ahead, I'm really confident that we can get um, Mary Kay, behind Mary Kay Papin's bill around due process and this whole thing, you know, we can move forward. And yeah, it's, it is time to move forward. I just have, honestly, this is a tough one, you know, because I know the people affected. You can't tell me New Mexicans don't care passionately about those that are more most vulnerable, whether it's the homeless people or folks that are struggling with addiction. We care about our our fellow citizens, and that's what's that's what's wrong with this whole narrative. It should have been front and center. It would have been um, in a different kind of political climate mm -hmm. in this last election. Uh, so um, we just need to move on, and I look forward to working with with my friends on the other side to make sure this doesn't happen again. And mm -hmm. and um, 
it's been quite a quite an it's been real emotional for a lot of I know Jerry you know yeah. this is Jerry's world yeah. you know and 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 so many close friends worked in those agencies that have been accused of fraud and even if their court suits succeed down the line it'll be two three years before all the dust settles they will have been out of business for a half a dozen years by then mm -hmm. you know it's really it's really a tragedy for this state and nobody's being held accountable for it that's the thing that really is galling so thank you for asking about it because i think people need to be reminded about what happened now, the other issue is where do we go from here? Yes. And as we try In to the reconstitute that remains. Yeah. <laughs> we try to reconstitute it. Senator John Arthur Smith, who is the chairman of our finance committee and probably has most control over what happens to the budget, has promised Senator Papin that there would be some additional money, even in our reduced mm -hmm. revenue estimates. He's gonna try to fund maybe not the whole package, but some of it so that we can start a five-year plan of systematically improving non-Medicaid behavioral health services to meet the need on the street. One I, did, I wanted to mention that I hadn't mentioned before is the supportive housing. We've got to get these people into supportive housing. If they're uh, on the street and alcoholic, they are not going to deal with their alcoholism until they're in some kind of stable living situation. So that's one of the most crucial ones in this whole package. And you have several bills to that effect. Yeah, we, we, yeah. we've got a couple at least, yes. Yeah, and you both have so many bills. I'm sorry we don't have time because yeah. you've got the hate crimes against the yes, homeless, right, and, right. and you've got the motorcycle helmets. Yeah, no, I mean, you've got you've got stuff that people are really passionately interested in. Yeah. But I really am grateful. This I think is one of the, the uh, huge crises in our state right now, the hit behavioral health crisis. And I want to applaud you for all the hard work and all the caring that, that you put into it. Our guests today are Senator Jerry Ortiz Pino. Thank you, thank and you. Senator Bill O'Neill. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Thanks, Lauren. And I hope you, our audience, has um, been able to comprehend this, the scope of what we're talking about. This is a really big problem in the state of New Mexico. We call it the behavioral health crisis. Look around you and see if you don't see the effects of what's happened in our state and in our communities and our patients. Anyway, I'm Lorene Mills. I'd like to thank you for being with us this week on Report from Santa Fe. We'll see you next week. Past archival programs of Report from Santa Fe are available at the website reportfromsantafe.com. If you have questions or comments, please email info at reportfromsantafe.com. Report from Santa Fe is made possible in part by grants from the members of the National Education Association of New Mexico, an organization of professionals who believe that investing in public education is an investment in our state's economic future. And by a grant from the Healy Foundation, Taos, New Mexico.